This morning I'm going to do a message on the Lord's Supper. Let me preface what I'm going to say by making this statement. I know that there are several very extremes on the subject of the Lord's Supper. Uh, first of all, there are folks who just don't understand it. And I hope the message this morning uh, will give some clarity to your mind and to your spirit about why we do what we do about the Lord's Supper. And of course, I would encourage you to come back tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, I also know that there are varying opinions uh, on the subject of the Lord's Supper. Uh, some of them are very strong, one way or the other. Uh, it's been my sad experience through the years in the ministry to see some churches go some very deep and to go through some very deep and troubled waters over opinions and convictions about the Lord's Supper. Uh, I would simply ask you to give me an audience this morning and listen to what I have to say. I understand not everybody's going to agree. I want you to understand uh, that uh, while I am a strong local church man, my whole life has been invested in local church work. Uh, only once in my whole life have I been involved in a ministry for a very short time that was not a local church ministry. So my whole life has been given to this, um, but yet I, I digress somewhat with a lot of pastors in that I or this church is not the final authority on who partakes of the Lord's Supper. That's between you and the Lord. It's kind of a yes and no, do and don't. Yes, the church is the place, but your local church is the place where you observe the Lord's Supper. But by the same token, you, between you and the Lord, are the final who partakes of the Lord's Supper tonight. I want you to understand that. But I do want to give this morning a clear presentation of... Uh, my convictions on the Lord's Supper, which are also this church's convictions on the Lord's Supper. Uh, so, first of all, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, Brother uh, Tuggle, why don't you pray for us, and then we'll deliver the message on the Lord's Supper. Father, thank you for your prayer. We have under your name today, Father, one of you, which is the Lord's Supper, Baptism 
or the Lord's Supper. They are ordinances, ordination, ordered by the Lord. Both of them in the simplest context are testimonials to your personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are observed in this order, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism first, and then the Lord's Supper. And in that order, baptism is an act of obedience, showing with this ordinance our faith in a risen Lord. The church is the only authority to administer baptism and the Lord's Supper. The subject is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. The mode is burial in war. The ordinance of the Lord's Supper is, in its observance, is restricted to the local church. The Lord's Supper is a memorial of Christ's death until he comes. If you do not have a copy of the church's constitution, bylaws, and statement of faith, please see us afterwards. We want everyone to have a copy. We made an effort some time ago to make sure that everybody has a copy. We have since had more folks join the church. And we want to make sure that you have a copy of that. Now, the teaching of the Lord's Supper, uh, there are two places. One is what we call the initial teaching personally. The Lord personally instituting the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Then there is the subsequent teaching and adding to by the Apostle Paul, but he got it from the Lord Jesus Christ. So first of all, there are two places I want you to go to this morning. The first will be Matthew 26. <clears throat> Matthew 26. <clears throat> Beginning in verse number 17. Now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread. Have to stop there. That needs explaining to a Gentile congregation. Feast of unleavened bread is another word for the Passover. In the Old Testament, the night under the circumstances of the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, the deliverance of Israel out of Egyptian bondage and the journey beginning to the land of Canaan. They observed the Passover, or here called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. When a lamb, a good lamb, a perfect lamb, a healthy lamb, was separated from the flock, each household, that lamb, after a certain time of observing, was then killed, and the blood was put on the doorpost. And when the death angel came through Egypt that night, when he saw the blood passed over that house, and the firstborn in that house lived. After that, Israel was delivered out of Egyptian bondage, and there was not a house of the Egyptians from the loneliest servant to the king's palace where there was not the death of a firstborn. All of this was a picture. The, the verse that explains what I just said about the Passover is John 1, 29. Behold the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Passover became the Lord's Supper on 
under the institution of the Lord Jesus Christ. The last Passover became the first Lord's Supper. So done by the Lord Jesus Christ before his death. So now you'll understand this. The disciples came to Jesus saying, And where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? Again, let me stop there and make an observation. The Passover was a eight-day observance. Began on the Sabbath with a meal. The whole week's events were included, including the Passover, the slaying of the lamb. It ended on the eighth day. Again, uh, uh, the Sabbath. It ended, it began and ended with a Passover or a feast of unleavened bread. The meal, the bread was unleavened. Leaven spoke of sin. Now, so the disciples said, Lord, where are we going to prepare for this? Remember, the Lord had no home. And he said, go into the city to such a man and said to him, the master said, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them and they made ready the Passover, the Passover meal. Under this setting, the last Passover the Lord ever kept, that comes now to be what you and I call the Lord's Supper. Now when it was even, evening, when evening was some, he come, he sat down with the truck in a barred room, large barred room. And as they did eat, the Passover meal. He said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Now he's going to tell them about Judas. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dipped with his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. Everything, and this would be a whole different message. This is a message only on the Lord's Supper, not the Passover and, and all that goes with it. But everything that's transpiring in this room now, every bit of it was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Everything that happened in connection with the, 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 the Passover meal and that week, Everything the Lord fulfilled it personally in his own life at, in, in this week of, of the Passover and the Lord's Supper and the betrayal and the arrest and the crucifixion and the death and the burial. Everything is a fulfillment of what happened in the Old Testament. So there is a volume in this little statement. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. And woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. That would be Judas. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he said unto him, Thou hast said. Yes, Judas, you are the man. Now, you would have to go to Mark, to Luke, uh, Mark 14, Luke uh, 24, and John 13 to get the follow-up. You know, Judas leaves, he sells the Lord. Uh, later he uh, gets 30 pieces of silver for selling the Lord to his enemies, which, by the way, is, is the price of a slave. The Lord was sold for the price of a slave. And, of course, later on he has remorse, not spiritual remorse, but physical remorse, takes the money back, throws it down, goes out and hangs, hangs himself. Uh, that all is more material for another time. I'm trying to keep it down to just the subject of the Lord's Supper. So, now, the, the evening Passover meal is where the Lord institutes 
the Lord's Supper. The church does not keep the Passover meal. The Lord keeps the Lord's Supper. So here we go. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, unleavened bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Now there are uh, two very erroneous theories. That's all they are. Uh, false uh, doctrines uh, that say uh, literally, for example, the Roman Catholic Church says literally when you take the Lord's Supper, that literally becomes His body. That's impossible. The Lord was there in the body instituting the Lord's Supper. So you know that can't be anything. Secondly, the Roman Catholic Church and some other fringe groups teach that that's how you get saved. Baptizing and taking the Lord's Supper is how you get saved. No, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, not of merit. So, taking, this is my body, that little wafer, unleavened wafer that you're going to take tonight, represents, symbolizes, is a picture of the broken body of Jesus Christ for your sins and for mine. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you, for many, for the remission of sins. It is the shed blood of Jesus Christ that is the covering, the atonement that causes the justification uh, of our sins being drawn on Christ and His righteousness coming on us. The Lord did not literally there spill His blood. And when you take that little cup of wine tonight, that little sip of wine tonight, that's not literally becoming the blood of Christ. Like the bread, it is symbolic. It is a picture. It is to, That little red thing is to remind you of your salvation paid for by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to say something about the wine. The Lord Jesus Christ drank wine. At the Lord's Supper, at the Passover, they drank three full glasses of wine. One on the first day of the uh, on the Sabbath when those that eight days of that festivity began. One at the conclusion of that meal. And thirdly, at the conclusion of the entire week. They actually drank three glasses of wine. We obviously don't do that. Tonight at the Lord's Supper, you're going to get a little sip. Now, this is where there's a lot of controversy in churches, and I think a lot of good men of broken fellowship. That's not necessary. What we learn, and, and, and let me read verse 29, and, and I'll show you five things. Number one, uh, but I say to you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine. Until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The last Passover, the first Lord's Supper. When we get into the teaching of the Apostle Paul, we're taught that we do this together as a church as long as we live. This doesn't stop until Jesus comes back. This little portion in Matthew teaches Three or four very simple principles. Number one, the Passover by the Lord became the Lord's Supper. Number two, we learned it was the Lord's Supper. It wasn't breakfast. It wasn't lunch. Some of you may say, well, why can't we do this at noon? Well, it's the Lord's Supper. It was an evening meal. Number three, uh, the drink was wine. Now, I want to be very gentle and I want to be very kind. Now, I just want you to listen to me a minute. You'll get about this much. I mean, barely a sip tonight. I just
I want you to think about something to you that some of you have pretty strong opinions against. So I just want to think about something. The Lord institutes this. The Lord would not ask you to do something that will later lead you to sin. <coughs> the Lord would not ask you to do something that would hurt you. The Bible would not ask you to have an ordinance or something in your life that will later turn you into a drunkard. Now, I, I don't want to argue with you, and I'm not arguing with you. I'm trying to be just as gentle about this as I can possibly be. I'm just giving you something to think about. Now, if you don't believe that, you don't believe it, that's fine. That's between you and the Lord. I'm just telling you, I'm just showing to you what the Bible says. What do you do with that? That's between you and the Lord. The bread was unleavened. And how long do we do it? Till Jesus comes back. Now, the Apostle Paul, by divine inspiration, goes a little deeper into this subject. So second, I need to return to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. First Corinthians 11. Beginning in verse number 23. 1 Corinthians 11, 23. For I have received of the Lord. So where did the Apostle Paul get his teaching on the Lord's Supper? He got it from the Lord. So we can safely assume on biblical authority that what the Lord taught Paul is the same thing the Lord did in Matthew 26. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. The teaching of the Lord's Supper, the Lord, the Lord gave to Paul, Paul gave it to the churches. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do, in remembrance of me. Tonight we're going to have a remembrance service the Lord's work for us. Someone has called it the gospel of the eye. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. The New Testament is a new covenant sealed for us by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Now, having been totally honest about everything, I want to be totally honest with you about this. It does appear that the Apostle Paul enlarges on something that the Matthew record does not show. And that is the little word oft, which means often. I'll say two things about the word often. Number one, that appears to say more than once a year at Easter time or at Passover time. But by the same token, I also, in, total, in being very honest to the text, I also have to say this. The Bible nowhere demands or specifically tells people how often to do the Lord's Supper. There is no timetable in the Bible given for the Lord's Supper other than, obviously, the Lord's timetable at Passover or the week before Easter, which is the reason we do it tonight. You should have no problem with people or churches who do it every fifth Sunday or every month. And some churches do it every Sunday. Don't have a problem with that, folks. Because the Bible does say, as oft as ye would, as oft as ye drink. This church is sticking very strictly to the model that the Lord Jesus Christ gave in the book of Matthew. For as oft as ye drink, eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Okay, I explained all that symbolically. Now, here is where the Apostle Paul adds something very, very important. 
Folks, uh, let's not get so hung up on crossing the T's and dotting the I's and demanding our position that we forget the spirit of the Lord's Supper. The spirit of the Lord's Supper is that number one, we're believers and we have His love in our hearts for the Lord and His love in our hearts for the brethren. And the Lord wants things to be right between us and Him and between us and each other. And Paul adds the very important dynamic to the Lord's Supper of our position, our hearts, our love, our relationship to the Lord, to each other being right. So, verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily, in other words, when you come tonight, I you walk with the Lord? Are you in fellowship with the Lord? Is there peace between the Lord and your heart? Are, 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 you, are, are you at peace with your Lord? And number two, uh, how's your fellowship with, you, with, with your brethren, with, with everybody? I, I, you know, there has to be a time of self-examination. Very much so. Shall be guilty the body and the blood of the Lord. That simply means you're, you're partaking of the Lord suffer unworthily. Well, does that matter? Or does it? Uh, before we get done here in a few verses, what they were doing at the Lord's Supper, they were getting drunk. Now, I'm not trying to be ugly or sarcastic, but, but you're not going to get drunk on grape juice. You're going to get drunk on wine. So Paul understood that the element, the blood, was represented by wine. By the way, uh, good wine, and I know nothing about wine. I, I'm a teetotal abstainer. I can't tell you anything about wine, but I do know, theoretically, one of the things about wine is the way it's made, all the impurities are out. It's the only thing, the right kind of wine is the only thing that properly typifies the perfect blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. In other words, don't come to the Lord's Supper when you're mad at somebody. Fix it before you come. But let a man examine himself. Now, I, the pastor, the deacons, this church as a body, does not examine you and determine who can partake of the Lord's Supper. That's up to you. That's up to you. But let a man examine himself or herself. And then, or so, after the self-examination, there are means of that bread and drink it of that cup. Now, again, the church of Corinth had lots of problems. There were lots of immorality in the church. There were splits in the church. There were there was personality issues in the church. They were fighting in the church. They were gluttony eating in the church. Uh, they were mistreating the poor. I mean, this, this church had more problems than you can shake a stick at. <clears throat> for, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation. In other words, judgment or punishment to himself. Now, we're not talking about losing salvation here, but we're talking about the Lord using corrective discipline in the church. It's very important. The Lord is using corrective discipline in the church. Lost people can't get, saved people can't get lost by taking the Lord's Supper. Not discerning the Lord's body. When we meditate upon what our Lord has done for us, we, when we look at that little wafer and represent us and know what that represents, when we look at that just a little sip of wine and we, we think about what, what that represents and what the Lord did for us. Folks, that ought to keep us broken enough to want to be right with the Lord and want to be right with the brethren. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep not. 
I'm a biblical literalist. The literal sense makes sense unless clearly stated otherwise. You mean because these people were behaving so badly, the Lord actually struck people in the church with sickness and death? Yes. Yes. <coughs> Having said that, however, let me say, you know, I have known people who were afraid to come to the Lord's Supper. Don't be afraid. This tonight at 6 o'clock is going to be the most sweet, precious, loving service that this church has. This is not a ritualistic, formalistic thing. This is a sweet time of fellowship of believers. So what do we do about it? Well, here you are, verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened. We are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. The Lord treats the sinning believer differently than he does a sinning unbeliever. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together, tarry to eat. Tarry one for another. The church of Corinth, they were mistreating each other, especially the poor. And the Lord says, when we come together as a church, we're one body. No big shots, little shots. No, we're one body. We love each other. We care for each other. We, we, we interact with each other. Work for my brethren. When you come together to eat, tarry one for another. So, that is the biblical teaching on the Lord's Supper. I want to encourage you this afternoon, we don't meet back till 6 o'clock tonight, I want to encourage you to meditate on these verses. You might want to uh, take the, the scriptures that I've explained, Matthew 26, verse 17 to 29, and 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 to 34. You might want to think about them and read them. And pray and see what the Lord has to say to your heart. And then, folks, come tonight at 6 in fellowship for a very pleasant time in the things of the Lord. And if for some reason you don't think you can, we understand that. Whether you come or not, we love you. You're one of us. Whether you come or not, may the Lord bless you. Let's stand, please. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Someone would like to receive the Lord this morning. If you would like to come, if you want to come and pray, we welcome that. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word which teaches us. Thank you for the Spirit of Christ in us. Teach us, Lord. Help us to be sweet, kind, and humble, loving to one another, because that's how we express and show our love for you. Thank you for the work of Christ in history and in our lives. Lord, bless our time together today. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. We're going to sing number 49. Number, hymn number 49. Hymn number 49.